Hi everyone, this is the lecture to accompany Chapter 2 in your textbook. After you watch this lecture, you'll need to complete the Learn Smart Chapter 2 assignment. Okay, let's talk about how culture and gender affect communication. But before we begin, I want to discuss something very important. You're going to hear and read things in this chapter and throughout the book that claim that particular groups of people have particular characteristics or qualities. Social scientists like anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, and communication scholars have to generalize about populations quite a bit in order to make sense of the world. A generalization in this context is a statement about a population based upon a finite set of observations and testing, which claims to hold true for the population in general or a subset of that population, but not necessarily for any individual within that population. So if we make a generalization, say, about a certain group of people, what we're saying is that the thing we observe tends to hold true, but may not hold true for any one person. That's a different thing than stereotyping, which is something that scientists try to avoid doing at all cost, but is very commonly used among people in general to describe other groups of people. Stereotyping happens when you say that all members of a group have the same qualities or characteristics. Stereotyping often goes beyond blanket generalizations to distorting the truth by misrepresenting it, caricaturing it, or even lying about it. For instance, the stereotype that all blondes are dumb doesn't even qualify as a scientific generalization because it's simply not true. Well, you might have known a blonde person who wasn't the brightest bulb in the chandelier, but that doesn't make all of us dumb. So, when you hear me saying that certain groups of people tend to have certain characteristics, know that it's not stereotyping. It's generalization. And if you happen to fall into a certain category of people and you think, I don't have that characteristic, well, of course you don't. We're all individuals, despite belonging to certain groups. We'll start with culture. When we think of the word culture, we often associate it with a place. We think of American culture as being here in the United States, French culture as being in France, but culture isn't about places. It's about groups of people. The book defines culture as the system of learned and shared symbols, language, values, and norms that distinguish one group of people from another. Now, having said that, you might realize that you belong to more than one culture. Maybe your parents were born in Mexico and immigrated here, bringing many parts of that culture with them, and you grew up surrounded by that, but also in American culture. Many of us identify with one or more groups of people in this way. The book refers to people who share a given culture as a society. To put it simply, the groups of people with whom we identify and who are likely part of our perceived culture, we consider to be our in-groups. On the other hand, groups of people we don't identify with, we consider to be out-groups. While some people might think being perceived as different is exciting, most of us are stressed out by it and may even experience culture shock, which is the struggle to adapt to an entirely new cultural environment. Part of that stress comes from ethnocentrism, which is the preference we have for our own culture over that of another, unfamiliar one. We naturally think ours is better, but that's only because it's more familiar to us. But we are not necessarily born into a culture, and culture is not always tied to one's ethnicity or race. For instance, if a white American family adopts a Chinese baby, that baby's race might be Chinese, but it's going to be brought up as an American and will learn American culture. That process of learning and acquiring a culture is called enculturation. Cultures are often different from each other in many ways. One of the most obvious ways is in their use of symbols. A symbol is anything that represents something else. Language is based on symbols. The words are representative of different objects and ideas but other things are also important representations of culture. For instance, in the United States, we have many symbols that represent us, like our flag, our national anthem, the bald eagle, baseball, hot dogs, and even apple pie. Other countries have their own symbols that represent them. Great Britain has Big Ben, the Queen, and Bangers and Mash. Another way that cultures vary is in their languages. 
Language is a primary way in which culture is passed down from one generation to the next. There are approximately 7,100 languages used in the world today, but three of them, Chinese, Spanish, and English, are the most commonly used. Another way in which cultures vary is in their values. Values are the standards that we use to judge things, how good, desirable, or beautiful they are. Different cultures may place a value on different qualities, characteristics, or objects. For instance, in the U.S., we tend to value equality, material comfort, practicality and efficiency, achievement, democracy, free enterprise, and individual choice. Now, other cultures may feel differently about these things and think that other things are more important and valuable. Cultures often vary in their norms, which are the general rules or expectations that guide people's behavior in a culture. As an example, what's considered proper, respectful, or polite in one culture may be considered the complete opposite in another culture. In the U.S., unless you're very close friends with someone, you don't generally hug or kiss them when greeting them. But in many other cultures, it's not only fine, it's expected. I was having a discussion on Facebook with a friend of mine who recently married a Brit and moved to England. She said the way they hold their silverware to eat is entirely different from the way we do it here. It's just one of many things that are different between our two cultures. Within cultures, there are an enormous number of co-cultures. Co-cultures are groups of people who share values, language, and norms related to mutual interest or characteristics besides their larger culture. So that means that a co-culture can arise around any shared interest or commonality between people. Think about all the things you're interested in, and maybe you even get together with other people to do those things together or talk about them together. That's a co-culture. Here are just a few. Runners or other athletic activities, sports fans, LGBTQ, deaf culture, Star Wars fans, RVers, Lutherans, Rockhounds, scrapbookers, well, I could go on and on. People within these co-cultures share values about what's important. They often have specific language called jargon that they use to describe things. They have norms and customs that relate to that mutual interest. You might have realized that you're a member of lots of different co-cultures. And these days, it's easy to go online and find other people who share your interests. And on that note, social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook are actually co-cultures in and of themselves. They use their own set of symbols like hashtags, language like tweets and likes, and norms about what is okay to post and what is not. Let's talk now about some of the ways in which cultures differ from each other and how we might misperceive other cultures because of those differences. The first difference has to do with the general belief of a culture when it comes to responsibility. Who are we most responsible to and for? Members of an individualistic culture, like us in the U.S., believe that our first and most important responsibility is to ourselves. And while we're certainly often responsible for other people, it's up to us to make something of our own lives. Nobody can do that for us. On the other hand, many other cultures are collectivistic in nature, and they believe their primary responsibility is to their family, community, or tribe. In Italian and Mexican cultures, the family is everything, and your individual wants, needs, and desires aren't as important as what's good for the family. People from those cultures might view those of us from individualistic cultures as self-centered and thoughtless and we might view them as unwilling to take personal responsibility. Neither one of those things is true, but those stereotypes exist. Then we have low context and high context cultures. This is directly related to the way we communicate. The United States is considered a low context culture. We tend to appreciate direct communication and to say what we mean. We like straight talking people, or at least we say we do. On the other hand, people in high context cultures like Japan tend to convey meaning in a much more subtle way. They don't come right out and say what they think. In high context cultures, you're expected to figure out someone's real meaning by watching how they behave and taking context and environment into account. One of my former students used to run an import business 
and he worked with Japanese manufacturers all the time. He would go to the plants and check on their progress, and when he would ask when the shipment would be ready, he would always be told two weeks. But nothing was ever ready in two weeks. He finally realized that the response was given to him because the Japanese managers thought that's what he wanted them to say, and all he needed to do was look around and he could determine for himself how long it would take to complete his order. They weren't lying to him, at least not from their perspective, but you can see how we might think so. People in low power distance cultures believe that no one person or group should have all the power. That's our ideal belief here in the U.S., although it doesn't always work out in real life. High power distance cultures are comfortable with the idea that certain groups have more power than others. The caste system in India is an example of that. Then there are masculine and feminine cultures. Now this really isn't about gender. It's about the belief a culture has about traditional gender roles. In a traditionally masculine culture like Austria or Japan, Men traditionally work outside the home while women tend to the family, but in a more feminine culture like Sweden, people are less likely to split those roles up between the genders. The United States these days has moved from a very masculine culture to a moderately masculine one. While women have made some inroads into traditionally masculine occupations, we still tend to place more value on stereotypically masculine undertakings. In monochronic cultures like the United States, we place a high value on time. We believe it to be a finite commodity, and we think it should not be wasted. We appreciate people who are on time and consider lateness to be a bad thing. However, many other cultures like those in Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of the Middle East, and the Pacific Islands don't see time in the same way. Punctuality and efficiency really don't carry that much importance. When I visited Hawaii, I was taking scuba diving lessons. Now the trainer said the class would start around 2. I was there at 1.45 because I'm always early. The instructor didn't get there till 2.45 and we didn't even start until 3. While some people might think that is lazy and unprofessional, it's perfectly acceptable behavior in a polychronic culture. While most humans are not that comfortable with unfamiliar things and uncertain situations, some cultures really don't like it at all and want things to be comfortable and familiar. Argentina, Portugal, and Uruguay are societies that value security and don't like ambiguity. On the other hand, there are some cultures that would be considered more uncertainty accepting, like Hong Kong, Jamaica, and New Zealand. These people are more accepting of uncertain and ambiguous situations. The U.S. is somewhere in the middle of those cultures. We like security, but we also like interesting and novel things. One of the reasons that intercultural communication is often challenging is because we use different cultural communication codes. What means a particular thing in one society may mean something totally different in another society, and sometimes we can get into trouble by misunderstanding what's being communicated. Idioms are phrases whose meaning is purely figurative. In other words, the literal meaning of the phrase has nothing to do with what it actually means. In the U.S., if someone said, kick the bucket, they didn't literally kick a bucket, they died. But someone from another culture might not know what that means. Jargon is another way we can be misunderstood. Actually, jargon is language that's understood by people in a particular co-culture. But if you're not a member of that co-culture, you might not understand it. For instance, the word stretch has an obvious meaning, but when a firefighter uses it, it has a completely different meaning, which is to lay out and connect the fire hose and nozzle. Gestures, which are part of nonverbal communication, can also mean different things in different cultures. Gestures that we consider positive, like thumbs up or the OK sign, might be considered insulting in other parts of the world. It's always good to be culturally aware, and understanding the ways in which cultures differ can help you avoid misunderstandings. Let's move on to gender and communication. When we talk about gender, we're not just talking about men and women. Gender is neither simple nor straightforward. It includes psychological gender roles, biological sex, and sexual orientation, 
And those are all different things. So let's look at all of those components of gender and how they affect communication. Gender roles are culturally constructed norms for how men and women are expected to act. Think about what your culture, or maybe your co-culture, like your religion, expects from men and women, and you'll understand what gender roles are. Now, people don't always act in the way they're expected to when it comes to gender roles, and depending on the culture, that can have negative consequences for them. There are generally three gender roles, masculine, feminine, and androgynous. When we think of masculine characteristics, we think of things like strength, aggressiveness, competition, and risk-taking. We don't tend to think of emotional expressiveness, empathy, relationship maintenance, caring, because those traits are generally considered to be feminine. That having been said, regardless of your sex, you can still express traits that are either masculine or feminine. In fact, that's what the term androgynous means that an individual can express a combination of masculine and feminine traits. Biology is a major factor in gender. Biological sex refers to the actual biological expression of what sex you are. That's a combination of the following factors. Your psychological makeup, this refers to how closely match your belief about what sex you should be matches your physical sex characteristics. Then there are genetic factors to consider. There are chromosomal disorders that can cause problems. And there are anatomical factors. Sometimes people look like one sex on the outside, but have the opposite sex reproductive organs internally. This can cause both physical and social issues as people try to make their way in the world, not quite fitting into their culturally defined roles. Finally, Sexual orientation is a major part of gender. This refers to the sex or sexes to whom we're attracted. Heterosexuality is the most common, and it means someone who's attracted to people of the opposite gender. Homosexuality refers to an attraction to others of their own gender. Bisexuality refers to an attraction to people of both sexes, and asexuality which is rarely discussed in our culture, probably because most people have difficulty with this concept, it means someone who has little or no feelings of sexual attraction for other people. This list has recently been expanded to include things like pansexuality, gray or demisexuality, and the concept of queerness, which incorporates anything that's not heterosexuality. Communication issues can revolve around sexual orientation. First, because many societies frown on any expression of sexuality other than the most common one, which is heterosexuality, a person's sexual orientation may not even be addressed because of the potential negative repercussions. And when someone finally decides to tell their friends and family in a process known as coming out, they might face rejection. Even today, discussing sexual orientation can be a tricky minefield. The last thing we want to talk about in this chapter is the way our gender affects communication. I want to remind you that this is not about stereotyping or saying that all women act one way and all men act another. We're all individuals. However, research has shown that particular genders are often socialized to use particular communication styles. So let's look at those. First, expressive talk, which is talk that is used mostly to express feelings and the primary way to establish closeness, is most commonly seen as a female communication trait. While instrumental talk, which is used to work through and solve problems and accomplish tasks, is generally seen as a male communication trait. If you've ever found yourself in a discussion with your significant other and the woman is talking about how she feels about a problem she's having with another person, and the man says something like, well, you should just tell that person, then proceeds to explain how to fix the problem. Well, if you're the woman in this scenario, you probably aren't thrilled about your husband or boyfriend telling you what to do. And if you're the man, you're probably confused when she gets upset with you. That's because, generally speaking, Women like to talk about a problem from different angles and with different people. They probably already know the answer. They just want to be heard. 
men tend not to want to do that. Instead, they just want to deal with the thing head on. I think that's where the concept of mansplaining might have come from. Men, if you don't know what that is, just ask a woman. She knows. So, women talk around the point, while men tend to get straight to it. Men are also associated with more powerful speech, which includes talking more, giving more opinions and orders, and interrupting more frequently. Yes, I said men talk more than women. Do you find that hard to believe? It's true, though. Here's the thing. Women talk more about things that men may not be particularly interested in, which gives the mistaken impression that they talk more. They are just talking more in situations and about topics on which men would generally be silent. In contrast, women ask more questions and are not as certain as men when they make statements. So women are more apt to say things like, well, maybe, or I think, or sort of, or it might be, while men are more likely to just say, this is the way it is. Another reason that it might seem as if women talk more is because men use shorter sentences, while women speak in longer sentences. Men are more likely to refer to themselves while women use more references to groups like we or they. Women often tend to use more adjectives and descriptive words than men, while men are more interested in how much of something there is or how big it is. Touch is a very important form of nonverbal communication. It tends to be used differently by men and women. Among adults, people of different sexes are more likely to touch each other than people who are of the same sex particularly men. They tend not to touch other men very much. Women are different. They use touch as communication with each other more often than men do. You might believe that women are more emotional than men, but that's not true either. Both men and women have equal capacity to feel emotion, but women are more likely to express emotion than men are. Men, because of the societal and cultural belief that men shouldn't show emotion, tend to hide it until they can't anymore, and thus they end up expressing more negative emotions when they actually do express emotion. Women also exhibit more affection behaviors like hugging and kissing than men do. Again, this might be due to societal expectations, but it also is learned behavior as women tend to receive more affectionate behavior in childhood. Some researchers also think that differences in male and female hormones could promote affectionate behavior among women and stifle it among men. As we've seen in this chapter, issues of culture and gender often play a big part in the way we communicate with others, particularly those whose culture or gender differs from ours. Now you're ready to complete the Learn Smart assignment for Chapter 2.